Thanks to KiwiCo for supporting this episode of Journey to the Microcosmos. Click the link in the description for 50% off your first month of any crate. These little moving domes are a ciliate called Corona pediculus. That's Corona with a K-E, not Corona like the beer or the virus. These are much cuter, especially as they climb up and down these stalks like it's their own personal jungle gym. But it's not exactly a jungle gym open for the public. Just ask this Noplius. Oh, wait. You can't, because those stalks are the tentacles of a hydra, and getting close to them was the last mistake this Noplius ever made. This isn't our first time diving into the world of hydras, but there were a lot of details about them we could only talk about before. We couldn't actually see them. But now, with the upgrades we've made to our microscope, there's a whole new world inside of hydras for us to see. Like these nuclei, lying inside what we're pretty sure are stem cells, which are the source of hydra's incredible regenerative capabilities. And not only are they constantly giving birth to new cells inside the hydra, they may have also given birth to the field of experimental zoology in the 18th century. In 1744, the scientist Abraham Tremblay immortalized hydra in our collective scientific knowledge when he published his book, Mémoire pour servir à l'histoire d'un genre de polypto douce à bras en forme de corne. If you, like me, have not studied French in more than a decade, that translates to memoirs concerning the natural history of a type of freshwater polyp with arms shaped like horns. Yes, what we call tentacles today were once called horn-shaped arms, but in French, so it sounded elegant. Tremblay was not the first person to describe Hydra. For you frequent viewers, you probably won't be surprised to hear that Leeuwenhoek got there before him. But when Tremblay first saw his so-called polyps, he didn't know what they were. He thought they were a plant because they were just sitting there, their horn-shaped arms waving like branches attached to a stationary body. And what seemed to further support his argument was the fact that different polyps had different numbers of arms. And that might not seem striking to us, but think of the animal species you know. Barring any sort of injury or disease, we think of our cats all having four legs, ants all having six legs, and so on. But plants can have different numbers of leaves and branches even when they're the same species. Tremblay decided to see if there were any other plant-like qualities to these polyps, and so he cut one in half. He figured that if those cut halves grew back out, that was one more check in the plant column. And so it didn't surprise him when he saw the halves regenerate. It was kind of like using plant cuttings to propagate new plants. It's very cool, but also not out of the ordinary in the world of plants. So it was weird when he saw his supposed plant catching some prey, including a millipede that got tangled up in the hydra's arms. And not only were the polyps capturing prey, they actually seemed to move around on occasion, which meant that this polyp wasn't a plant after all. It was an animal. And so that meant that the regeneration Tremblay had observed was actually quite out of the ordinary. In fact, it ran contrary to the initial assumptions that had driven Tremblay to bisect his polyps to begin with. The assumption that only plants could regenerate. If the hydra was an animal, and the hydra could regenerate, then yeah, it looked like some animals could regenerate too. And going beyond the spectacle of regeneration, Tremblay had found an animal that could make more of itself without having to mate. We know that hydras aren't the only animals that can reproduce asexually. They're not even the only animals that can regenerate. 
But Tremblay's observations were novel at the time he made them, and our subsequent knowledge is built on his observations and techniques. And that's why some scientists argue that Tremblay's work marked the foundation of experimental zoology. If you think about it, at every turn of Tremblay's discovery lies the hydra's tentacles. When he decided to cut the hydra in half, it was because of the discrepancies he'd found when counting their tentacles. And when he later rejected his own hypothesis that the hydras were plants, it was because he saw their tentacles capturing prey. When you look at hydras, their tentacles are probably the main thing that stand out because otherwise for an animal, they're quite simple. They're basically a bag with streamers attached. And yet, despite that simplicity, hydra are very good at catching prey and also very good at not becoming prey. And that is all due to the power of their tentacles and the special cells inside of them called nematocytes. Again, thanks to our microscope upgrades, we can see those nematocytes more clearly than we have before. And we can even make out the special vesicles inside of them called nematocysts, which discharge at incredible acceleration to punch through targets when activated. The nematocysts aren't just for punching, though. They're also loaded with a paralytic venom that can be fatal, as this Snoplius here is experiencing. If this all sounds and looks kind of brutal, it is. But it's also kind of elegant. If you take a closer look, you can see that some of the nematocysts start to look a little bit different from each other. That's because hydra have four different types of nematocysts, each with their own job. Stenotils for paralyzing prey, desmonemes for ensnaring it, holotrichus isoriza for protecting against predators, and atrichus isoriza for helping the hydra cartwheel around the microcosmos. Nematocysts are multifunctional, powerful, and also very rare so rare that they're restricted to the phylum Cnidaria, which in addition to hydra also includes jellyfish and sea anemone. That doesn't stop other animals from trying to get some nematocysts of their own though. One species of flatworm is known to not only get past the hydra's nematocyst defenses, they'll kill the hydra and steal those nematocysts for themselves, decking themselves out in the molecular artillery of their deceased prey. So if the nematocysts are so deadly and the hydra tentacles are so full of them, how do ciliates like Corona pediculus survive in this chemical and physical minefield? Well, we don't know. Corona pediculus aren't immune to the toxins in the nematocysts, so they must somehow be sidestepping the issue altogether, but we don't know how they do that. Now, it's possible that the hydra are simply allowing the corona to live on their bodies. You see, they're not exactly trigger happy with their nematocysts. They do have some level of control here to make sure the nematocysts are deployed correctly. Some of those controls make hydra more effective hunters. For example, while nematocytes respond to physical stimulation, if there's a chemical hint of prey nearby, the amount of physical stimulus needed to activate the stenotils and desmonines goes down, getting Hydra on the alert and ready to attack. And Hydra must also have some way to distinguish between predator and prey, because they're able to turn off their defensive nematocysts while capturing their next meal. Plus, if the Hydra has caught something, some of the extract from their food will actually turn off the locomotive nematocysts to keep them from moving away during their successful stationary hunt. So clearly the hydra has ways to regulate its nematocytes, and maybe the corona is taking advantage of one of those mechanisms. Maybe the hydra is too. We don't know, but for the corona, I guess it doesn't matter. Instead of being targeted by the nematocysts, the ciliates are protected by them too as they scavenge food from the surface of their gracious host. And so the corona pediculus climbs and climbs, not knowing what a deadly horn it ascends. 
Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. And thank you again to KiwiCo for supporting this episode. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids that make learning fun. They have eight subscription lines, each catering to different age groups and topics. And each box is designed by experts and tested by kids. And with a KiwiCo subscription, each month the kid in your life will receive a fun, engaging new project that will help develop their creativity and confidence. With their Tinker Crate intended for kids nine and up, your little one can put together this really cool color mixing LED crystal that will teach them how to use red, blue, and green LEDs to explore mixing colors of light so they can make whatever color crystal they want. So if you want to keep the fun and learning going all year long, head on over to kiwico.com journey50 or click the link in the description for 50% off your first month of any crate. The people on the screen right now, they are our patrons. If you like what we do here, these are the people to thank. And if you would like to become one of them, you can go to patreon.com slash journey to micro. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out Jam and Germs on Instagram or pick up his new book, The Hidden Beauty of the Microscopic World. And if you want to see more from us, there's probably a subscribe button somewhere nearby.